Hi, this is Arun Patwardhan, and welcome to the session on initialization in Swift. Today, we are going to look at different aspects of the initialization process in Swift. We will also look at the steps involved in initializing objects in Swift. There are two different ways in which stored properties can be initialized. Swift allows you to provide a default value that is used by the initializer during the initialization process. You provide the default value at the point of declaration of the variable. Or, if you did not provide a default value, you can provide one during initialization within the init method itself. There are four different initializers in Swift. Default, memberwise, designated, and convenience. If we declare a class where the stored properties have a default value provided, then Swift will provide default initializers. Take the example shown. We have a class car with three properties, name, passenger capacity, and max speed. Passenger capacity and max speed have default values of 5 and 120 provided to them respectively. Since name is an optional, it will automatically get the initial value nil. In such a case, a default initializer will be provided to class car as default values have been assigned to all member variables. Memberwise initializers are provided only to structure types. The idea is to give an easy way of providing your own custom values to the member variables through the initializer. This is irrespective of whether a default value is provided or not. Take the example of a struct point. It has two member variables, x coordinate and y coordinate, both of whom have been assigned a default value of zero. If you look at the statement below, where we are calling the constructor for point. This is a constructor we have not implemented. This is an initializer available which takes two arguments corresponding to the two member variables that allow you to provide your own values for x coordinate and y coordinate. The last type is actually a combination of two types. It is very common for a class to have multiple initializers so that there are different ways in which we can initialize an object. Wouldn't it be nice if we could take the common steps from all the initializers and place them in a single common initializer, which the other initializers could then simply call to? Designated and convenience constructors allow us to do just that. The common initialization steps are placed in the designated initializers, while the unique steps are placed in their own independent initializers. The convenience initializers then call the designated initializers to perform the common initialization steps. This diagram illustrates how the de designated and convenience initializers work and exist. We have a parent class which has only one initializer, which is the parent class's designated initializer. The child class has two designated initializers and three convenience initializers. Convenience init1 delegates to the designated init1, while convenience init2 and 3 delegate to designated init2. Designated init1 and 2 in turn can only delegate up to the parent class designated init. We will look at this process a little later when we look at an example. The initialization process is a two-phase process with some built-in safety checks. So what are the safety checks? First one, make sure all variables declared in the class are initialized before delegating to the parent class. This means that any variables that are declared in the class must have an initial value before the constructor delegates up to the parent's designated initializer. Second, make sure that the parent initializes inherited properties before the subclass assigns a value to them. 
what this means is any variables that are declared in the parent class must be initialized by the parent class's initializer before the subclass which inherits these properties can assign any value to them. Also make sure that any convenience initializer does delegate to the designated initializer. And lastly, make sure you call instance methods or refer to self only after phase one of the initialization process. Let us now have a look at the two phase initialization process. Phase one initialization creates and initializes the child and parent objects. Phase two is when an additional initialization is done as per our requirements. To understand this, let us examine the process with an example. Here we have a class called parent. It contains a member variable called x, which has a default value of 90. Then there is a designated initializer. We then have a convenience initializer. Note the keyword convenience before the init keyword. This is how we mark an initializer as convenience initializer. Also note that the convenience initializer first delegates to the designated initializer before assigning a value to x. Next, we have a child class, which inherits from the parent class which we just saw. The child class also declares a variable called y, which has a default value of 10. The child class overrides the initializer of the parent class. Note the keyword override. This is the initializer, which is the designated initializer of the child class. There is also a convenience initializer, which first delegates to the designated initializer of the child class before assigning x and y any custom values. Let's examine the init process with the help of the statement var child obj which is of type child, equals a call to the constructor of child where the value 1, 2, 3, 4 is passed in as an argument. This is actually a call to the child class's convenience constructor. So basically the child class class's initializer has been called. The first thing that happens is memories for variable y is allocated. Next, the memory for variable y is initialized with a value 10. This is the default value that we had provided at the time of declaration. The call then delegates up to the designated initializer of the child class. The designated initializer of the child class ensures that all properties belonging to the child class have been initialized before delegating up to the parent designated initializer. Once that safety check is ensured, the parent designated initializer is called. It first allocates memory for variable x and then initializes it to the value 90, which is the default value we provided at the time of declaration of the variable x. At this point in time, phase one of the initialization process is completed. This is because the parent class is the topmost class and there is no other class up to delegate to. At this point, we can now refer to self and member functions. The call then returns back to the designated initializer of the child class, which in turn returns the call to the convenience initializer of the child class, which is now free to assign custom values to y and x. So as per the code that we have written, y gets the value 1, 2, 3, 4, and x gets the value 3, 7, 0, 2. This slide goes over the flow of the init process we just saw in a graphical map. First, the convenience initializer is called. Memory is allocated for y, and y is initialized to 10. The convenience initializer then delegates to the designated initializer of the child class which in turn then delegates to the parent's designated initializer, which first allocates memory for variable x and initializes it to 90. At this point, 
phase one of the initialization process is completed. Self and member functions can now be referenced. Call returns to the child class designated initializer, which then returns back to the convenience initializer of the child class, where Y is assigned the value 1, 2, 3, 4, which was passed into the initializer, and X is assigned the value, which is three times the value of Y. In this case, it is 3702. Let us verify that all the safety checks were also obeyed. Make sure all variables in this class are initialized before delegating to the parent. Yes, that does happen because we have assigned a default value to both the variables which are used to initialize the variables at the point of creation. Make sure the parent initializes inherited properties before the subclient class assigns a value to them. Yes, that does happen. If you notice, the first thing that happens is that the initializers delegate up all the way to the parent class before any custom initialization can happen. Make sure that the convenience initializer delegates to a designated initializer. Yes, that does happen. This is enforced using the self.init call. Call instance methods and refer to self after phase one of initialization only. In the example we've taken, we do not have any situation where this happens. So it would be difficult to demonstrate this. And that's how the initialization process works in Swift. The only point to note is that since structs do not allow inheritance, there is no parent to delegate to. Other than that, everything is the same for structs. When it comes to inheriting initializers, there are two ways in which that can be achieved. Initializers are automatically inherited when the subclass does not define any designated initializers, or if all the superclass designated initializers are implemented in the subclass, then the subclass will automatically inherit the superclass convenience initializers. Of course, you can always use the override keyword to override the initializers provided in the parent class. In most cases, inheritance of initializers may not be required as you may want completely different initializers for your subclass. And that was a brief overview about initializers in Swift. If you have any questions, simply visit the URL mentioned or drop me an email at arun at the rate Thank you and see you again.